So I, I'd love to say that, um, <coughs> that you're coming to SU gave you all the success, but you actually <laughs> had that before you showed up. Uh, I'll give you some of the credit. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if you don't mind, let's, let's start with that. I mean, you've been extraordinarily successful. You've been building your career, helping ma people manage capital. Uh, you came out to our executive program, um, which a number of the folks here. Can I actually have a show of hands? Who has been the executive program here at SU? Oh, okay. Excellent. So we have uh, about 30 people in the audience here. Uh, what was your experience? Why did you come? What did you walk away with? Was it what you expected? It was a great experience, uh, well worthwhile. I would uh, heartily uh, recommend it. I went for two primary reasons. Um, most of the folks I found, uh, only about 30% of my class, I think, were uh, from the United States. The rest were from various parts around the world. A lot of Russians, a lot of Europeans, uh, some Asian. Uh, a lot from Central and South America as well. And I found that the uh, global dynamic of the uh, audience to be rather uh, fascinating and very helpful to the uh, event itself. Faculty outstanding. Uh, I went for two primary reasons, because most of the folks there were not in, uh, financial advisors or on uh, my side of, of the Wall Street environment. And the, the first reason I went was, um, how does my advice need to change that I give to my clients? Uh, if we're going to live so much longer, as Ray suggests, um, if college is going to become so much cheaper, uh, as you suggest, uh, how does that impact the advice I give my clients on college planning, retirement planning, estate planning, uh, and so on? Uh, so the first question I had is, how does my advice need to change for my clients? And the second is, how will I change how I deliver that advice for my clients? Uh, so uh, the information that I got was uh, extremely helpful, and I've been a, an avid student uh, of exponential technologies ever since. So uh, <clears throat> let's take a second to provide context. What do you do? I'm a financial <coughs> advisor, financial planner. We are a financial planning firm and investment management firm. So we, do, uh, we help people figure out how to achieve their goals in life. For most folks, it's buying houses, getting kids in college, saving for retirement, caring for elder uh, relatives. And, uh, and then developing an investment management strategy to help them achieve those goals, along with all the other aspects of personal finance, insurance, taxes, mortgages, employee benefits, uh, on and on. And so you deal a lot with two ends of the spectrum, right? The general public you're advising via social media, media radio, TV, and then high-end wealthy wealthy clients. Yeah, our, we, we are well known for being a mass affluent organization, unlike most <coughs> others in, in the industry. Our account minimum is only $5,000. Uh, so we don't care if you're not wealthy, we only care if you want to become wealthy. Uh, we have a, an awful lot of high net worth clients, as you'd expect a firm like mine to have with $13 billion in assets. Uh, but we're well known for catering to uh, the mass affluent, uh, the emerging affluent, and the aspiring affluent. So let's talk about, you know, in your estimation, does the general, does the, even the mass affluent or the aspiring affluent, any idea what's coming down the pike at them? None. From, uh, none. Th this country is clueless uh, about this, this stuff. Uh, is any country, I mean, uh, the, uh, the equivalent in France or England, I should let, 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 use those two countries, uh, in uh, Holland or Japan, uh, do they... What do they, is anyone in, uh, I, clued, based clued in? on the conversations I had and the relationships I've developed with some of my colleagues uh, and fellow students at, at my executive program, I would say no. I'd say the world is largely unaware. How many of you are, are astonished at what you're learning here so far today? The statistics, the facts, and it's not so much that the world is becoming the Jetsons. I think we all get that. We, nobody is shocked and surprised at what is coming. I think where the shock is, is the speed with which it's coming. The fact that we're talking about these disruptive technologies in three to five years, as opposed to 30 to 50. And I now, think- I'm still waiting for my Jarvis to come in five years time. You don't have one yet. Not, not no, yet, I'll, I'll lend you mine. <laughs> uh, and, and so we, we have to recognize that because of the speed of what's happening, it, it is requiring a radical shift in thinking. Uh, in an approach to investing, in an, a, an attitude toward goal setting, uh, and how this impacts the family structure, how you're going to care for aging parents, how you're going to prepare your children for society. Uh, and I think this disruptiveness is largely uh, oblivious to most Americans, which is why I've been focusing on it so heavily on my radio and TV shows and in our newsletter. We're developing a seminar now uh, to bring to the masses. And we are also working uh, with one of the largest providers in the country to uh, develop uh, an exchange-traded fund that will focus on investing in companies 
uh, involved one way or another with the uh, uh, notion of exponential technologies to give ordinary consumers an opportunity to invest in the kinds of companies that are currently n unavailable to them. Sure. And, and we're seeing, uh, you know, at more than any time ever in human history, the rate at which billion dollar companies are being created coming at us, right? We're just seeing, I mean, what was it? Uh, I read uh, Uber had a near $20 billion valuation. Just a couple of days ago, yeah. uh, the folks who created Instagram became billionaires in 18 months. It took Bill Gates about 20 years. It took Henry Ford about 40 years. So yeah, the speed with which wealth is being created uh, is faster and faster, and investors need to understand the implications this has for their portfolios, the nature of volatility, the essential element of diversification, and the fact that with our longer life expectancies, the notion of retirement and the notion of investing in a conservative fashion income oriented portfolios at ages that are frankly out of date. Uh, there is a massive shifting in, in thinking that has to go on with advisors first, which is why I'm trying to spread this word within the advisory community, and by extension to their clients who are the ultimate consumers of the investment marketplace. So let's talk about uh, the advisory role. How long before, frankly, one of your customers is turning to Watson instead of to you? It's already beginning to happen. There are online providers, Wealthfront, Betterment, there are now about 30 or 40 online sites that will, for an extraordinarily low fee by Wall Street standards, for 25 basis points or less, there's one site that got launched six months ago that is doing it for free. They are building highly diversified, globally-based portfolios using ETFs at zero cost. So how does the typical advisor who's charging 150 basis points uh, compete in that environment. It's so a, it's demonetization. In ver the internet wants everything to be free. We know that. Uh, as Feynman said, uh, there's a race to the bottom. And so in that environment, if your only value proposition as a financial advisor is price <coughs> and performance, meaning I'm going to get you better performance than the next guy and I'm going to charge you less for it, you're, you're done. Uh, there's no way that you'll be able to compete against the internet, let alone Watson on your cell phone. Uh, being able to deliver this. So it's forcing financial advisors, most of whom are, don't realize this yet, that we have to change our value proposition. We have to offer something to the client that Watson isn't going to be able to deliver on the smartphone uh, or that a robo-advisor won't be able to deliver on the internet. We created Edelman Online uh, offering the same kind of product technology that you can get at Wealthfront, Betterment, and the other sites. So we're wor very well versed in that. But I did it largely to understand better how this works. And um, I think most advisors are oblivious to what's going on. Those who aren't oblivious are in denial. Many of those not in denial are impotent in figuring out how to fix it. So they're screwed. Um. Uh, we believe most advisors in five to 10 years will be out of business. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a big statement. That's a big statement. Uh, again, we're seeing this sort of technological unemployment, if you would, uh, potentially creeping in in different places. I, I see the same thing in medicine occurring, of course, right? Um, we're seeing it across the board. Real estate agents are being replaced by technology. You don't really need a real estate agent anymore because you can go to Zillow. Uh, we're finding it in uh, the mortgage brokerage arena where you can go online to get your mortgages. We're doing online banking constantly. Obviously, you're taking a photograph of your check to make a deposit. So uh, we're seeing this across the board. And so the traditional services that have been provided by stockbrokers, insurance agents, financial advisors, uh, CPAs, is all radically evolving, radically changing. It's getting faster. It's getting cheaper. It's getting more uh, easily accessible, all of it great news for consumers and ultimately for the financial markets. The stock market's going to skyrocket. The question is, are you going to be able to profit from that the way you have in the past with a 2% annual fee? Um, that's going to be the, the real challenge. So the key is to develop a different value proposition. And I believe as a result of this, when I say that most advisors won't be in business, they're going not as independents the way they are now. There are several hundred thousand independent financial advisors. They're going to have to merge or consolidate uh, or get acquired by other firms because individually they're not going to be able to compete against the organizations that have the resources to deploy this technology in a massive, uh, scalable way that consumers are going to be able to relate to. I can see the first AI that comes over and, and starts acquiring uh, financial advisors. Hey, listen, I'd like to buy your company. Um, you've had a chance through your relationship with SU and through your own work uh, to look at the various exponentially growing technologies we talk about, computers, networks, sensors, AI, uh, 3D printing, synthetic biology, and so forth. What are the couple that you're most excited about? 
Uh, sensor technology is number one. Um, uh, 3D printing is number two. Uh, most, everybody's talking about the Google car, for example. What they don't realize is that the Google car is a result of sensor technology. Sure. It's all about being able to, for a machine to detect its environment. Uh, and, and then to be able to act on it requires physicality, which is why 3D printing is going to be the big deal. So those two areas are going to leapfrog everything else and drag everything. Everything else is going to follow in its coattails along with it. So the machine learning and, and AI, which are vital, are all going to be offshoots of taking advantage of uh, the sensor environment. You know, where you're going to be wearing tattoos that are going to diagnose you with uh, biometrics. Your wall is going to know when you walk into a room and what the temperature is and how many people are there to know how much ambient light and temperature is necessary. Your refrigerator will tell you when the milk has gone bad. It will automatically order new milk for you. Uh, all of this is going to be re relating to sensor technology and 3D printing. And we're going to. Uh Later in this program, have Avi Reichenthal, who's the uh, CEO of 3D Systems. Uh, full disclosure, I'm on the board of 3D, uh, which is one of the leading companies. And, and really, it's amazing that we are on the cusp of, of the disruption of a $10 trillion manufacturing industry. It's really rather uh, astonishing. And so the rules are going to change. And, and as I mentioned, it's the speed with which they're going to change that I think is confusing a lot of folks. Um, we are. Um, very encouraged, very enthusiastic about it. There's no question there's going to be massive disruption. And it's going to be very difficult for a significant amount of time for a significant number of people. But society, the economy, the markets are all going to prosper very, very heavily. But there is going to be dislocation. There is going to be challenge. Um, one thing that is paramount is the ethics uh, of all of this. Just because we have the ability to do it, does that mean we should? If we do not, out of an ethical constraint, what does that mean for a foreign nation or corporation that has no such ethical concerns? Uh, we're going to have to deal with these issues. We've got to get Congress involved very, very early, meaning we're already late, because Congress tends to be, react. They wait for a development, and then they make a law about it. We can't wait. We don't have that luxury of time. And we've got to get um, ethicists and legislators aware of what's happening uh, so that we can help to guide this to minimize the disruption that's going to occur to millions of American workers. So uh, we're about to go to lunch break. Uh, a piece of advice for the investing public out there. What do you, what's your... We believe that uh, technology should represent a larger percentage of the portfolio than it has historically, particularly focusing on exponential technologies and in two areas. One are those developing the technologies, but another, which is being ignored largely, are the users of technology. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that the biggest growth uh, opportunities rest in the technologists because they come and go. Uh, you're only as good as your current technology and somebody tomorrow will do a better you. Um, but the users of that technology, those who know how to apply it into the marketplace in their businesses, are the ones that are going to be uh, market leaders in their industries. So those are... Uh, uh, the slants that we're beginning to adapt for our own clients. And as one focus of disclosure as well, uh, following my participation at uh, Singularity University uh, in the executive program, uh, I became an investor in the university and I'm a guest lecturer. So uh, I'm a big fan, big believer in what you're doing. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Edelman. Thank you very much. Peter. Thank you.